So good evening, everybody. It's so great to have you with us this Sunday evening. Thank you for taking the time. And a very big warm welcome and a heartfelt hug to Amy Markham from Mount Holyoke College uh, in Western Massachusetts. Amy is somebody I have known for just short of a decade now and one of the admission officers I feel emotionally closest to. And I want to publicly thank you, Amy, for uh, your greetings. I had a tear in my eye when I saw your video, uh, you know, when my, my uh, staff uh, sent that uh, video across celebrating 10 years of the practice. So thank you so much for that. Uh, it's been great knowing you, fantastic, uh, professionally and personally. So thank you for joining us and thank you for being such a good friend in so many ways. Thank you so much. That, that is such a heartfelt, really lovely introduction to hear. And um, to all of you who are attending this, this webinar, I really want to just say that you are in such good hands because um, everything Dr. Manhana said about me and our relationship, I would say right back about him. And you are really just being guided by somebody who not only cares deeply, but has a tremendous network of admission professionals that he can call on um, for input and direction. And he just is very highly respected in our field. So I'm honored to be a part of this and to join you this evening. So what we're going to do is um, talk about the five must do's of admission essays. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, just get, give me a quick moment to get this set up here. Um, Okay, so I know that you have spent a lot of time in the last week learning about so many different aspects of application essays. And so what I was asked to do was to talk about the five must do's of the essay. And there's really, this is such a subjective thing to talk about. So there's so many different things that I could talk to you about. And people that have already presented to you might agree with some of what I say and might disagree with some of what I say. And that's really okay. I think because you're having so many different presentations on this topic, you'll start to find themes in what's being presented to you so that you can have takeaways that you can adapt for your own situation. So none of these are hard and fast rules. I'm just gonna share with you some of the things that I think are really important to keep in mind. So first, I'm just wondering, um, and I wish that I were presenting to you in person because I'd love to know how you're feeling about your essay. And I think that people who get started early can feel a little bit excited and optimistic about it, but those who wait longer have a lot more anxiety. And I hope that by sharing some tips with you by the end of this and all the other presentations that you're hearing over this week or so, that you're gonna feel a lot more like the person on the left than on the right. But before I get into the tips specifically, um, I wanna just say something about the situation that we're living in right now. And I know that this was touched upon in a previous uh, essay session that was presented by Union College, so you know what the common application offers you in terms of opportunities to speak about COVID-19. But what I really want to emphasize is that as admission officers, we are super aware of how hard this is. And I think particularly in a place like India, where your population density is quite high and it's much more difficult to even leave your house. Where in the United States, a lot of us are be able, able to get out for a walk and still keep social distance. And that makes it a little bit easier to manage this time. So we are really aware of how hard learning online is, being away from your friends, the uncertainties you're facing, and all of that. But what I want to say is that while we have a lot of empathy for that, I probably wouldn't choose it as an essay topic unless you feel like there's a way in which you're experiencing this time that's really different from other people. So perhaps a family member has had COVID or you've had it 
or it's impact, impacted your family's financial security or um, something that isn't sort of the norm of how people around you are going through this. And if you can write about it, that in a way that shows real impact rather than just describing what you're experiencing, it might be a, a good topic for you. But I'm gonna leave it at that and then just um, launch into the tips. So the first one is choosing your topic wisely. And here's a little reflection back to the COVID situation. Um, a lot of times we get essays that um, are on a theme and they pretty much all sound the same. So you can kind of see how exas uh, exasperated this person is by having kind of a, a stereotypical essay that just describes the circumstances of the time that we're living in, but doesn't really go into what it's personally revealed for the writer. So you want to stay away from that. But so when you're choosing an essay, I feel like it's really important to hit on at least one of these points. So what really in my mind separates a good essay from just a story um, is that a story can be memorable, but it doesn't always reveal that much about the storyteller. So we learn about something that happened to that person that they experienced, but we haven't, as, as admission application readers, we haven't been able to get to a higher level of understanding of something that really matters to that person. Lots of times what I call story essays, I get to the end and I say, well, that was interesting, but I don't know why that person picked that thing to write about. I, I can't tell. So I, I, there hasn't been much revealed. There hasn't been much that's shown me um, how well the person knows themselves what's been impactful. And the fact that you're in this workshop suggests to me that you're probably applying to pretty competitive and perhaps even extremely highly competitive colleges and universities. And at that level, decisions are kind of hair splitting differences that are being made. So if you can show some thoughtfulness, insight, self-awareness, those are things that are going to enrich a classroom and enrich a college community. And that's something that will set you apart from, the, from somebody who just tells an interesting story. It shows a depth that's characteristic of an intelligent and engaging person. And that's something that we really want to see. So here's where I will share something that might be a little bit different than what you've heard in some of the sessions you've had already. And that I will say not everybody will agree with me, but I'm going to share this just to give you something to think about. So oftentimes students are, set, are, are told, you've got to immediately grab the reader's attention. So that's called having a hook. Um, or you've got, to, you've got to transport the reader into a space or time and use a lot of description. Those to me are elements of writing that might be more, um, it, something in an English class or you're writing a short story um, or some type of a creative piece of writing. And what I find is that for most people, I can tell when they've, they've followed that advice and they've tried to incorporate it into their essay because it seems very forced. So I've, I have um, read essays where it starts out with some really exciting or gripping statement and then it just moves into a story that doesn't really flow with what kind of got forced in at the beginning or with the imagery or the mood. Um, you know, it starts out and it says something like a, a feeling of calm descended over me as I looked across the tranquil lake as the sun set in the distance over the mountain. Well, if we go back to the previous slide and you think about some of these things that are really helpful to incorporate to share something about yourself, that mood isn't really part of that. So it's not wrong to do that, but just you've got a, a limited amount of space, so you need to choose carefully how you're going to use it. So number two, answer the question. This is another place where my, I have some colleagues who actually think differently than I do. Um, I want to learn about you, but I also want to evaluate how will you address the essay prompt that you chose. Now I have colleagues who say, you know what, if the essay is good, I don't really care if it goes off track from the question. Um, 
But in my mind, when, when you're applying to a college, you're going to be taking classes and professors are going to give you assignments to address certain questions and you have to be able to answer them. So if you don't answer the question in your essay, then I have to think about what type of student I'm going to be delivering to our classroom. So I want somebody who can do that. I also think that it shows that you followed the instructions if you answer the essay prompt. The other reason I like that is that most essay prompts will kind of drive you toward what we're really looking for. And I'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes when, when we look at some sample essay topics. So we're going to flash back just, to be, just briefly to the, the first must do. So remember that you're talking, you're trying to incorporate one of these things into your essay and you're trying to choose one of the prompts that is meaningful to you and it's going to be a prompt that allows you to stay on target and to address one of these points. So here are a few of the common application choice essay prompts for the 2021 application. And there's seven altogether. The first one I will say is my probably my least favorite because it's really not very directed. And most students use it to tell a story. And when I look at the second part of this, um, the, the last sentence, it says, if this sounds like you, then please share your story. What I want to know when I'm reading that particular essay is what is it about that background or identity interest or talent that's so meaningful? Why? Don't just tell me what it is. Tell me why. And so this one is a little bit hard to evaluate in terms of that answer the question must do because there isn't really a question. You're just to told to describe something. So it's not one of my favorites, but you can still write a good essay on this topic. Um, the next three all have, and, and there are two others of the seven, all have what I call part A and part B. So part A is what is the thing? So the lessons we take from obstacles we encounter can be fundamental to later success. Part B is really the question part of each of these. How did it affect you? What did you learn from the experience? What was the outcome? Now on the, that third one, what was the outcome? I would focus a little bit more on what prompted your thinking. So the, the essays that will guide you the most and be, help you um, really answer the question are the ones that are looking for you to really evaluate and share what was impactful for you. You have to keep in mind that we're all people. Um, that we're, we're like you, we're different from you, we're different from each other, and not every admission officer is looking for exactly the same thing. We're not robots. So what this means is that there are some kind of inherent contradictions within admission committees on what people are looking for in an essay. And that can be a little complicated for you because you don't know who's going to answer your, who, who's going to read your application. And what is important for you to know is that in most cases, most admission offices, at least two people are going to read your application. And that's to kind of balance out the fact that not everybody has the same priorities. So what does this mean for you? I would say on the first two bullet points here, I would err on the safe side. Some people really want you to answer the question. Others don't care. I would err on the side of answering the question because the person who doesn't care isn't going to think it's wrong that you answered the question. But the other person, if you don't do it, is, is probably not going to be so happy with your essay. Uh, some people are kind of forgiving if there's a few minor errors. Other people will really have a very negative reaction to a spelling mistake or a grammar error. So that's something you want to pay special attention to so that you're covered in either case. And then in this last example here, we talked a little bit in the previous section about imagery and creativity. Um, I would say that if, if you write with a lot of description and that's how you like to convey your ideas, that's absolutely fine. But just keep in mind how much time you're spending on that versus conveying your message so that you have a balance. 
detailed explanations often I find take away from a direct message. And I'm going to give you an example of one that helps will maybe help you see why I'm one of the people who likes to see the question addressed. So I'm going to share with you the opening paragraph of an essay that someone wrote who was applying to dental school. So the essay prompt was explain why you want to pursue a dental career. So here's the first paragraph. It's a little bit long, but Good morning, Francis, I joyfully sang as I woke the resident I was assisting in the memory care unit of the nursing home I had been training at to become a certified nursing assistant. After Francis woke, I led her into the bathroom to assist her with oral hygiene. Before we began, she, had met, she mentioned that many of the other nursing assistants were not diligent in brushing her teeth, leaving her with a dirty mouth and bad breath. Acknowledging her grievance, I was determined to provide her with the proper oral care that she deserved. After a thorough session of teeth brushing, flossing, and mouth rinsing, Frances smiled at herself in the mirror. It was evident she felt happier. It was at this moment that I realized how proper oral care could improve an individual's quality of life. Feeling rewarded by my work, I began assisting many residents with dental hygiene. After some time, I found that residents who once secluded themselves were socializing and smiling more. Through this experience, I learned that helping people through oral care was very rewarding to me. My involvement in the nursing home setting has confirmed my interest in becoming a dentist, as well as my intention to provide dental care to vulnerable populations. Now remember, the essay prompt was to explain why you want to pursue a dental career. So I think this is a really good example of how this person used 206 words in her opening paragraph of an essay that can have 650 words. And she gave a story, but she didn't really address the question, which at a dental school, wouldn't you wanna know more about her interest in dentistry than so many details about how she became interested. So, that kind of ties in with the next must do. You really need to be able to reflect on meaningful times or people or events in your life. This kind of connects to choosing your topic wisely of showing growth, self-awareness or new perspectives rather than just recounting the facts as, as you saw in that example that I just read to you. So most of the essay prompts that part B that we talked about is what's really kind of driving you to the reflection. And that example about, you know, if, if there's something about you that's so important that your application would be incomplete without it, that essay doesn't push you to reflect, which is probably why personally I don't love that essay. I find that in reading applications for a selective college, I want to focus more on someone's self-awareness and ability to talk about their change in perspective, growth, insights, things like that. And frequently, essays will tell a story that lead to a final paragraph where someone says, and so that's how I learned that I really like helping people and that dentistry is interesting to me and it's the career I want to pursue. So they tell the story and then they hit on the, the part B in one or two sentences at the end. Your essay will be a lot stronger. You can tell a story if you want to, but weave throughout your essay those reflections of as you're telling things that were happening, bring the reader into what was your thought? What were your aha moments? How were your perspectives changing as you were going through that story? that will really make a much more compelling essay. This slide I really love because um, I'll just give you a few seconds to read it while I'm not talking. So the reason I like this so much is that I, I really feel for um, students writing essays because you want us to know so many things that are important about you and things that you care about. And there's a real temptation to try to jam everything into your essay. You want us to know so many things. And so this, this to me is just a great example of that temptation to do that. 
but really if you if i keep coming back to this dental school essay so for that young woman she really wanted us to understand what she, what her experience was and how that had led her to um how that had led her to becoming interested in her future career but as you can see from this cartoon she wanted to say so much about it that really there was only a very small intersection in what she wrote with what she was being asked to write about so just really keep a check on yourself with that to make sure that you're not sharing so many things that yes they're important to you but they're taking away from what actually is is really important to others i see that there are a couple of questions so i'm gonna um just hold amy could yeah amy could we yeah. just get to the questions right at the end instead of breaking oh, okay your oh, okay, sure. yeah. okay all right I just have to close them out here. Okay. Um, so uh, focus on what the reader needs to know and think about the prompt in determining what the reader needs to know. And remember the things in um, earlier on where we're talking about that impact, the growth, the change in perspective. Okay. So the last must do that I have for you is to verify and check. So there's a real paradox I find in writing, and that is the harder, at least for me, the harder I work on something, the more times I revise it, I get to a point where at one point I might have thought, oh, this is going to be pretty good. And then I hit this point where I think, I have no idea if this is the best thing I've ever written or if it's awful, because I'm too close to it. So this is where, even though the essay is your work, it's really important to have feedback. So I always encourage students to share their essay with a few trusted people. And first of all, ask them to read the essay out loud to you. So it's very easy when you're so familiar with it and you're kind of looking it over, you anticipate each word that is to come because you've worked on it so hard and you know it so well. And so sometimes what happens is you overlook a missing word, or maybe there's a word that was in there at one point that you meant to edit out, but you didn't take it out, um, that, there's, that there's simple mistakes, or when it's read out loud, you might realize that there's some errors in punctuation, like you have a comma where it should have been a period. So that's why reading it out loud is important. But you also want to know when someone reads it to you, does it sound right? And by right, I don't mean right or wrong, but does it hit the mark that you were really trying to, um, th that you were trying to get to? Also, without guiding the people who are helping you to know what you're trying to accomplish, ask them what they took out of your essay. And if it's, if, if, you give it to several people and they're taking something away that is not what you meant, it means you've got to go back and you've got to do some other work. Also, they might have suggestions for you. They may really understand where you're going with it and they might think about something that you didn't think of that you could incorporate into your essay to make it even stronger. You might have to take something out to meet the word limit, but that, these are just some examples of why it's really important to get feedback and to, to have somebody else tell you, did you stay on point? I'm a big fan of kind of reading an essay and knowing where the student is going. And while I wouldn't want you to feel locked into the standard five paragraph essay approach, and I'm definitely not suggesting that. What I would keep in mind, at least loosely, is having some type of introduction that forecasts what's gonna come, and then tying it up with a conclusion that, that kind of mirrors the introduction. And that's always recommended um, in speeches as well. One of the, the things that is, is often advised is that you structure your presentation so that first you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And that's really the introduction. Here's what's coming. Here's the body of it. Let's recap. So let's recap. Um, you're going to work hard to choose your topic wisely and make sure that it shows 
something that, that um, highlights your self-awareness. I encourage you to answer the question, make sure that you stay on track. You're gonna focus on what's important, not all of the details and trying to put everything about yourself into the essay. You're gonna reflect the, so that you show that you can think and evaluate the meaning of things that have happened in your life. And you're gonna share it with other people so that they can give you some feedback and make sure that you're really on track. And so my hope is that if you do that, you're going to end up a lot more like this person than the other person that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. So um, would you like me to, do, to address the questions now? Absolutely, Amy, go for it. Okay, great. So um, we have a question, how much do we glorify the school? Do the, ah, all right, I'm so glad you asked this question. Um, do they really like demonstrated interests such as mentioning professors, classes, and things on campus? That is really important. And I think that you are gonna have an essay workshop about answering the why this college essay. Um, so this is such a hard thing that you have to do. And I sort of hate that we even expect students to do it because by asking the question, of course, we're sort of tempting you to try to glorify the school and to show us all the things that, that you've learned about it. What I will say is that when you, we, it's so common that we get um, sort of essays that I call a day in the life where a student will say something like, um, actually, you know what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop um, sharing my screen just for a few minutes here. Um, the, what, what we end up getting is um, the day in the life essay where someone says, as I rolled out of bed in, and then they name the name of the residence hall and walk to the, then they name the dining hall before I sit down in professor so-and-so's class about blah, blah, blah. And one of my colleagues calls that the researchy essay because you've shown us that you've looked all over our website, you've found things that you like, and you've stuffed them into an essay to show us everything that you've learned. Um, that is really not, not necessary. What I would say is think a little bit more about the fact, if, if you're, I don't know if you're all applying just to the United States, but I'm gonna pretend that you are just for the sake of this. There's 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States. So there's way more similarities than differences among so many of them. But somehow you had to narrow down your choices to get to a certain list. So why was it that these schools stayed on your list? What was it about those that separated them from others? So I would try to focus more on that rather than trying to show us that you've done so much research about the school or that you think that we have the best program in this or that, I would really just think about why you could see yourself at that school and talk about that. I know it's still really hard. That might not be super helpful, but I would say you don't need to stuff a lot of facts into that to show us that you've researched the topic. Uh, another question. Um, so for a why, this major, oh, okay. Um, what is the right proportion of personal touch? Okay, so if I understand the question is that if you're being asked, why do you wanna major in this? Or why are you interested in this university? How much should you put in about yourself? And how much should you put in about the major or the university? That's also a great question. I would probably put more about yourself in it. And this is another opportunity to show some of that self-awareness that we were talking about in, in the presentation that I just gave you. So if you, if, if you know yourself well, you can pick institutions that have characteristics that are going to be a really good fit for you. So some students will talk about, it, it, I'm gonna go back to the dental school essay again. That story that the student told was not a bad story. There was just way too much to it. So she could have said, 
that she had this experience her assisting nursing home patients with oral care and that she realized that that was a really important thing to their well-being and that made her feel like this was was a major or a career that she wanted so you can pick things about yourself and then connect them to the choice of your major or to the university that you have so i would probably go a little bit more on the personal side than saying you know accounting is a field that that um i don't even know i, I have, that's not a great example because i'm not being able to come up with something on the spot but don't describe the field that you're going to study and don't describe the university talk about yourself and why you're a match for that um is it let's see is it fine if the issue we want to talk about is political Oh boy, um, I love political essays, even if I disagree with them. I'm, I'm a politics junkie, so I'm really interested in how students think. But I also know that not everybody is interested in politics for argument's sake, in being up on current events. So you have to also realize that somebody else could be reading that essay who may have a really different opinion so it doesn't mean you can't write about something political, but I would say you need to be very careful about that because, again, you don't know who's reading your essay. So I think you need to write about it in a way that shows that other people, even if you disagree with them, you respect the fact that other people may feel differently. Um, and that can, that can be challenging. And it can also be something that starts to take away from your main point, which is something you need to be really careful about if you only have 650 words. So you need to be sure that you don't come across as intolerant. You need to be sure that you are conveying what you have to say in a way that shows that you have a really well-informed and thought out position. You don't have to recount all the facts about it, but at least make it so that the reader knows that you are a thoughtful person who weighs information and comes to your strong opinions carefully and, and in a well-reasoned way. Um, I, I like essays like that, but not everybody does. But here's where you, you have a great team supporting you who will be able to read what you've read and, or what you've written and give you some feedback about whether you're on the right track or not. Um, do you appreciate artistic liberty, for example, innuendos and wordplay? Oh, you guys are awesome. I love these questions. So, um, I, I do appreciate creative art, artistry. Um, I think that unless you're applying to a school that is known for creativity, you need to be careful with this. Not because it's wrong to do that, but because sometimes the artistry gets in the way of what you're conveying about yourself and your self-awareness. But if the essay prompt is encouraging you to be creative or you're applying to a program that focuses on creativity, I think that would be really appropriate. So with so many things, balance is probably one of the most important things to keep in mind. And I probably should have made that one of my tips, or maybe if I had a tip number six, that um, I would do that in the future. But innuendo is really tough for an admission officer to deal with. I put myself back on video because I, because we convey a lot through body language. We have, we have tone, we have word, words, and we have expressions. And when I'm just reading your essay and I don't know you, I don't know if your innuendo is innuendo or if it's literal and I'm just not getting your point. So it's, it's, it's a hard, um, innuendo is a hard thing to convey in a way that people are gonna get in the way you want them to. So I would just be careful about that. Again, it's not wrong. It's, it's a sophisticated form of writing for sure, 
It just needs to be executed in a way that doesn't confuse the person who's evaluating your application. And wordplay, um, I'm probably a little bit more of a fan of, of this if that's how you normally communicate. But again, if you've got somebody who reads in a very literal way, they might not get it. It's, it's kind of like satire where, you know, some people find satire hilarious and other people take it literally and don't get that it's supposed to be funny. So you, you just need to be careful with these. Um, if a university has a major why this, has a why this major, oh, okay, we answered that one. Um, any other questions? Amy, let me step in at this point. Okay. Um, and thank you so much for the presentation. I'm sure the questions will keep flowing in. We will address them one by one. I thought that maybe we can have a little conversation, you know, so. Sure. I really enjoyed that presentation. You know, it was simple. It made some very effective points and I think it's going to be super helpful for the kids. So thank you so much for that. I personally enjoyed it as well. Um, <laughs> A quick question, Does, do you use Slate? Do, do you use Slate? Slate? Yes. You use Slate? Yes. You know, I think it could be really helpful to tell the kids about how you go about reading an application. They're always curious, you know, how will they read it? Can you give them some imagery maybe of the process of your reading, maybe you're sitting at home, maybe you've got a cup of coffee, you know, maybe you have like 50 applications to read in a day. Could you tell them a little bit about how you read? I think that yeah. would be really helpful for them. Yeah, and you know, I actually have, I have one of my summer project goals is to put together with one of my colleagues some like 30 to 45 second video clips about, um, parts of the application reading process that never get addressed in um, sessions like this. And what you've asked, Niraj, is exactly what, it, it touches on what I wanna put in some of these videos. So um, first I'll, I'll just the, um, I'm gonna take a second to set the, set the stage and the, the mood. Like right now where you see me sitting, this is not where I sit to read applications because I live in the Northeast and it's very cold during application reading season and I have a wood stove in my living room. So the desk that I'm at moves into my living room during the winter months and it sits right in front of my wood stove and I have my cup of coffee that I can reach over to the wood stove and set it on the stove so it will warm up if it gets a little bit cold. I'm sitting there with a screen in front of me and I am reading with one of my colleagues who she actually works remotely. She lives in Michigan and we are reading, we're each reading the same application at the same time. So what happens is your application comes up on the screen and we, um, it's broken into the common application itself, your writing components, your, what comes from your school, what comes from your teachers, your test scores, and we can click through each section. We have an order that we read the application just so that we're kind of setting the stage with all of the personal stuff that you present to us first so that we get your take before we're getting into all of those other things. So, so we read in a linear fashion. And so I've got three screens up. Your application is on my middle screen. Then I've got a side screen where I am making notes about what I'm reading. And then on the left screen, Annie is there and I can see her, she's reading it too. And so we can, we're on mute and we will unmute ourselves and say, wait a second, um, did you notice this or did you see that? So, so we'll have dialogue. Um, and then sometimes we go through a whole application with no dialogue until the end, but we will interrupt ourselves somewhere, sometimes along the way. And then we will come to a discussion at the end and we'll give a rating to the application that fits a scale that we have. And we will make a preliminary decision on that application. And we will make, well, actually we'll make what we, what in that moment we want the final decision to be. And then we will also make um, 
in our rating system, it's called a preliminary system, but I really, it's really more of a fallback. So we might say, we love the student, we want to admit the student. But we also may know that by the time we get through reading all the applications, we may not be able to admit all of the students that we said, hey, yes. So our secondary rating is for a student we really want to admit, but we think, you know, this person might not make the final cut then that secondary decision we put in admit slash waitlist. So what that means is we really want to admit them, but if we had to, we could waitlist that student. And maybe we're reading something and we're thinking, you know what, this person is good, not, not a top candidate. So we say we really want to waitlist the student. We put that in as final decision. But then in that kind of um, um, flexible field, we would say waitlist slash deny or waitlist slash admit. So waitlist is the what we want to do, but if we find that that person um, plays the piccolo and the person who plays the piccolo in the symphony is graduating that year and we don't have piccolo players, we'd be okay admitting that student. But we also might say, hey, our waitlist is way too big. We, we thought the student was okay, but we didn't love her so much, so we could deny her. Um, so that's kind of how the reading process goes. But what I, what I do want to say that would kind of take you into some of these videos that I'm hoping to do this summer is there's a few things that um, you can't possibly know about our process, but I think are important for you to know. Um, and one of them is that, um, sorry, just a second. One of them is that um, the dates that are published for when we notify students of their admission decision are in some cases weeks later than when all of the applications are read. So we notify our students in probably around like March 20th or so, our regular decision students. We have finished reading the applications by February 25th. So students, if, if your application is not complete and you haven't gotten us everything by February 25th, your, your um, holding area decision is incomplete, which means that you're probably going to get a letter on March 20th, a notification that says, it, it may say just deny, and we might not tell you that it was because it was incomplete because you can log into our portal and see that things are missing and we've written to you and told you what's missing or if we thought there was something th that we wanted to encourage we might give you a chance to complete it but for most students what happens is like during that three-week period there can there's shifting around that's going on that's why we have that second temporary flexible decision in there. We are running our budget. We're looking to see of all the students that we want to admit, how much financial aid is needed. Does that fit our financial aid budget? Once we've finished it all, how many students are from what countries? We don't have any quotas, but we, we kind of want to be as global as possible. How many people are, um, are maybe graduates of alumni of our college. We want to make sure that we have a nice representation of that. Who has certain special talents? So it takes several weeks to do all of this shifting. So if you're sending us new things during that time, that may not be reviewed. So you really have to get it done. Don't think that even though the deadline is January 15th, you see our notification date is March 20th that you can send us something at March 15th, March 15th, because five days, we lock everything five days before we notify. We have to upload our portals. We have to print, um, we print admission letters. The financial aid process has to actually execute all of the financial aid. So your decision is locked even five days before we notify. So I think that's important for you to know. I don't know if that's too much. No, that was fantastic, Amy. I really enjoyed it. And it gave me an idea for our next presentation together at the next okay. uh, conference. We should do a myth versus reality of reading, you know, where you could do the reality okay. and I could do the myth and we can just have fun with that. 
Okay. Can I give just one more really quick sure, one? Sure, sure. Here's the other thing that, that students, you, you don't have any way of knowing. You, you will get messages um, if something's incomplete in your application and it will probably come over the name of the person who has been assigned to, to monitor your application through the process. So you might get a message from me it's, it, that's, that is probably automatically generated. Sometimes I send personal ones, especially if it's a student I know, and you'll be able to tell if it's a personal message from me. But so you get a message and it says, we're missing one of your teacher recommendations and we haven't um, yet received your declaration of finances form. And so you, you hit reply and it comes back to me and you say, um, Dear Ms. Markham, I talked to my teacher and she's going to send the, she's going to send the recommendation next week. Um, please let me know when you get it. Well, what happens is, so I'm reading about 800 applications and each application has on average 12 different things. So none of them are handed to me. They don't come in my inbox. So the only, I read an application when it's complete, it comes into my queue. So our, the system called Slate monitors what's been submitted and it puts it into my queue when it's ready to be read. So I get lots of emails from people saying, please let me know when it's there. How you know when it's there is that you log into your portal and you look to see if it's there. Every message that admission officers get that ask us to respond, lots of people just won't even answer those messages at all. I, I don't do that, I answer everything. But all of those messages are taking time away from our ability to bring thoughtful, time to reading the actual applications. So just know that we're not handed this <laughs> and that hundreds of students are asking us the same question. So it's just, it's, it's hard to address all of that. Use your portal. And if, if you know something's been sent and it isn't reflected, contact the general admission office email account and somebody will look at that for you. I think that's such an important point, Amy. And you know, I think students, parents, schools are going crazy on both sides of the table, trying to ensure that everything is submitted. So I, I think it's very good reminder to tell all the students, all our young ones today, that when you submit your application, that does not mean the game is over. Go back and make sure everything is submitted. This is your responsibility. Can you believe how insanely busy people like Amy and me are chasing so many <laughs> students, so many pieces of the jigsaw puzzle? So, this is your responsibility. We are here to help you make the process smooth, but we simply cannot chase the hundreds and hundreds of things that come. So thank you for that, Amy. I cannot complete the presentation today without inviting you to talk maybe a little bit about Mount Holyoke, right? Maybe some fun facts, maybe who, maybe, you know, who this college is a good fit for Dash, something interesting. Uh, I, I know that there are some students in this audience who would benefit from going to Mount Holyoke. I would just love to hear them. Um, I, I would love to hear you talk to them a little bit about it. Okay, I, and I, I would love to do that. Um, give me five, do you want five minutes? How much, how much I, do you want? Yeah, five minutes, you know, a couple of five quick, minutes. very important things. Something that you think, hey, if you're like this, you should check out Mount Holyoke. Okay, so what I would say um, is most important thing for you to know is that Mount Holyoke is a women's college. So it's really only going to be a choice for um, roughly half of the population, but realistically, even less than that, because a lot of students won't consider a women's college because they're used to thinking of, of university education as being co-educational. So, what I, what I want to say is that Mount Holyoke is the oldest women's college in the United States. And really by choosing Mount Holyoke, I'll, I'll talk briefly about a women's college in a minute, but because of something called the Five College Consortium, if you come to Mount Holyoke, you can have a women's college and you can have co-education. You can have a small residential college and you can have a large university experience. And this is because the four other colleges in the five college consortium are the University of Massachusetts, which has over 20,000 undergraduate students, and Amherst College, Hampshire College, and Smith College. 
So across these five campuses, there's 6,000 courses taught. There's 700 clubs and activities. There's a free bus that connects them. The farthest one away is 20 kilometers from our campus. And students use the exchange socially and culturally. Um, there's a group of Indian students at Mount Holyoke who have made friends with Indian students at UMass who have um, a satellite feed for cricket matches. And they go up to UMass and they've made great friends there and they cheer for their teams and they wear their jerseys and all of that. So, so I, I, one real point that I want to make is that coming to Mount Holyoke doesn't mean that you have to have 100% women's college experience. It doesn't mean that you have to have 100% small college experience because you can take up to 50% of your courses outside of Mount Holyoke's campus. We are 2,200 students. We're located an hour and a half west of Boston. We're three hours from New York City. I mentioned that it's cold in the winter, so we have four seasons. Um, I think the kind of student who is happiest at Mount Holyoke is somebody who um, is really open to thinking unconventionally and trying different things. By choosing a women's college, you're already doing something unconventional because 98% of women choose co-educational institutions. And so you're somebody who's able to say, you know what, I am going to step out of that mold. And I'm, I see that there are some advantages for four years in my life to be focusing in an environment where my voice can be heard. Um, I don't have to shout over other voices to get some attention. I can study in any field that I want, including male dominated fields, and people will assume that I'm smart and that I belong there. And I won't be the only female possibly in the classroom or people won't be thinking that I'm not good enough to, to handle that field. And I'll also be around other people who have taken this unconventional choice in choosing a women's college. And so they're already open to differences and doing things differently. So you end up being around a population of 2,200 people who are very much open and affirming of, oh, I'll try that. Or, you know, maybe your roommate is doing something that you've never even heard of, but you're like, hey, great, go for it. The tone is affirming. It's not, why would you want to do that? So, so it puts you in an environment kind of of yes, and you can. And that's not to say, I'm a product of co-educational um, education. So that's not to say that you can't have that in a co-educational environment, but you don't have it all around you. So it's, it's something that then when you leave to go out into the co-educational world for your career or for your graduate program, you've spent four years to the extent that you want to kind of dismantling some of the things that society puts on us gender wise that tell us this is for men, this is for women, this is for you, this is not for you. So that when you start your career and maybe you're in a place where women don't really have a voice, you're used to using your voice. And you can kind of pick and choose the times that you might want to press back a little bit and push your way into an opportunity that otherwise, if you hadn't had four years of becoming aware of some of these things that can inherently hold us back, you might not notice that they're going around, around on around you in your career. And so if you don't know they're happening, it's hard to push back against them. And I'll just use one little example um, that if I were doing a PowerPoint presentation with you, I would be showing you a slide right now that um, I'm sure quite a few of you have an iPhone. When the iPhone first came out in 2008, the um, icon for the contacts app was a silhouette of what was very obviously a man's head. So most people in their contacts have a mix of people, not just men in their contacts, but the representation of who was in that app was male. And Apple is a pretty forward thinking, cutting ed edge company. In 2008, they kind of realized, oh, you know what, maybe, maybe we should represent women here as well. So in 2008, the app 
had a shadow of a man's head and a shadow of a woman's head with kind of hair that it was very clearly a female head. So that took 10 years to do that. Then a year later, they took that away. And if you look at your phone now, there's a very gender neutral head on the contacts app. But these are things that I mentioned this when the, the duo, uh, the, the um, binary um, option came out in 2018 to a few people and they're like, oh, what? Hmm, I never noticed that. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about. If you don't know these things are going on around you, you don't realize the way that they can limit your choices. So Mount Holyoke is a place where you'll build your awareness about that. You'll be able to be affirmed. You can study one of 51 different majors. We have a small student faculty ratio. We have a very global community, 27% international students, and you will join a network of tremendous alums all over the world. 10% of our alums live outside the country that will be really a lifelong resource for you. Thank you, Amy, that was great. And I think I have seen that in action in the alumni of you Mount have, Holyoke yeah. uh, yeah. that I have met in India. I, I think the way they have shaped up, the, the way the college shaped them up, the way they carry themselves, it's very early. So as a counselor, I think I've seen the full circle and you know, from the moment a student enters your college. And I can tell you that maybe nine times out of 10, when I've spoken to a, a young girl in high school and said, hey, why don't you look at uh, a women's college? the reaction has been, oh, uh, let me get back to you on that one, you know. Yeah. And 10 times out of 10, a student of mine that has gone to a women's college has sent me an email closer to graduation or after graduation about how they couldn't thank me enough for sending them to that college, you know. So I, I know that you're doing a fantastic job for young women and uh, all power to you. I really cannot wait to meet you in the near future. You know, I hope this- uh, It's been way too long. <laughs> it's been too long. I'm looking we forward have to, to seeing We it. have to have breakfast together again sometime at a, at a Mumbai hotel where I eat all the Indian food and you, you eat all the Western food. <laughs> yes, <laughs> now everybody knows. <laughs> so take care of yourself, Amy. And, uh, you know, I look forward to seeing you soon. Same here and good luck to all of all of you students who joined this and um, really listen to your counselors. They've got great input for you and you will do really well in this experience. Super. Have a thank good you, evening. Amy. Have a great okay. day. Amy. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.